welcome back to the channel. Today I wanted to talk a bit about cultivating your capacity to care, which is you know a, um, another deep topic, like uh, like many of the things that I talk about, and it's obviously one that in, invites you to introspect and contemplate. You know what are the things that I care about in my life, you know, whether these are particular things, people, activities, projects, um, anything that sort of <clears throat> links you to the world in some kind of purposeful engagement. And you know, naturally, when we think about caring, we are confronted with, you know, it's negative, you know, the, the absence of care, um, a sense of lack, a sense of, you know, kind of lostness, you know, because we do feel lost when we look upon our life, when we look upon the things that we're doing and we feel like, I don't really care about this, you know, spending my days doing this or that thing, but I'm not invested in it. I'm not really sort of, it doesn't stir something deeply within me when I'm doing it, you know. And I think that when we look at a lot of people's lives, when they sort of exist in a state of work and perpetual distraction from work, um, we find that they're kind of in a bit of a, a fugue a fugue state, a kind of haze. They're not really that emotionally involved in what they're doing. And so they kind of just go about their days, go about their um, their commitments with a, just a kind of a mild state of dissociation. And this dissociation is kind of it's, it's useful, it's pragmatic on a certain level because if they were to become fully conscious what they were doing, they would re they recognise that they do not care about it, and that they're kind of in a deep kind of way um, wasting their their time and their attention. And you know, attention is our most primary, primary, <laughs> primary. I don't know, I can't pronounce words sometimes. It's our central way of engaging with the world. It's the most scarce thing that we have. You know, there's only so many things you can attend to in a day. And by extension, you know, only so many things you can attend to in your life. You know, it's kind of like it's finite in this similar sort of way in which your breath is. You know, you only have a, a certain number of breaths in your life going in and out. And um, you know, one day you will um, exhale your final breath, and that will be, you know, the uh, the book closed on your life. You know, it's not a bad or good thing. It's just it is what it is. And so, when we sort of think about this this scarcity of attention, it, um, you know, I don't want to say it to to scare you, to make you think you should be neurotically doing things as fast as you can because you might waste a moment, you might miss out on something, you know. I think that's rushing about is no way to really live life. It's a bit silly, really. Everyone's in a rush, everyone wants to be a productivity freak, but it just stresses your body out. You know, your body, it requires activity, but it also, although it's just as important, or if not more importantly, requires rest, you know, it requires moments of idleness, of just sitting back and not forcing your mind to be doing this or that thing that you think you need to be doing, you know, it's, it's so, it's t so perverse, I think, how our thoughts, our patterns of thoughts are conditioned, whether it's by our education, whether it's by the media environments we're brought up in, the social environments with all its different 
cultural cultural mores and norms you know we're sort of conditioned to think oh we, we need to be workaholics you know we've got to be working so fucking much you know to make ourselves a more productive and economically viable unit in the system you know and um, you know everything your thoughts are commodified you know in a weird sort of way we commodify ourselves by thinking that you know stuff on social media about productivity routines, morning routines, this sort of, this fetishize, fetish, I can't, fetishization, uh, I'm sorry, mate, it's uh, late in the day, I've already like recorded a few videos, so my like, my ability to speak is sharply diminishing, but um, yeah, this sort of, I don't know, I find it a bit absurd sometimes, you know, I mean, when I think about my own sort of productivity routines, I mean, I don't, I, I, I'm brutally honest, I don't think about it at all, you know, um, you know, my days, maybe I should think about it, maybe I should plan them, but I don't know, I kind of just, I do when I feel like doing, you know, it's all very intuitive, it's, um, you know, I do get a sense of, deep sense of meaning from working, so I don't well maybe maybe we should call it work but I think work is a very um, a general term there's many things different things that can come into it you know a lot of people think that work should be this sort of thing that it should be something that feels boring or mundane to do but for me like even if it's like there's a bit of friction to it to thinking about something to studying something you know I feel like I am you know, in the activity of working, when it's particularly when it's on a topic or a thing that I'm very interested in and that I want to learn about, when it's myself directing it, um, I have you know so much energy to do it, and it doesn't feel like it doesn't feel burdensome, burdensome for me to do it. It just feels like a um, you know, it feels like my purpose, you know. It feels like, okay, this is what I need to do right now. And it's not like a neurotic kind of, I'm going to shame myself if I don't do it. It's more just like, you know, I go through periods of rest and then I engage with a certain kind of activity where I'll be thinking about something, writing something down or recording this kind of video. And, you know, in that sort of activity, that purposeful activity, I feel like I'm cultivating in myself certain qualities and skills that I like to cultivate that um that they you know they they benefit me in a certain way because I'm you know in talking about this I'm improving my ability to to think on the spot to talk to speak about these sort of things but um and as well you know when I put it on the internet to people to listen to you know other people can derive certain like insights and um you know whatever interest they find um and I guess sort of like that work for me, it's um, it benefits me, but it's, you know, it's not, I don't do this stuff just so it benefits me. I do it because I feel, you know, particularly in the communication, um, there's a larger purpose beyond it, you know. I think we shouldn't feel as though we're working just for ourselves. It's a very isolated and atomized and alienated way of being in the world. You know, we're, we're social social creatures by design we're meant to integrate in networks in whatever way that should be and um i don't know i just think it's a, it's a very lonely way to live when you're living purely for yourself when you're cultivating all your things just for yourself you know because who are you going to share it with and i guess that's something that's particularly comes when people operate in life in a according to this kind of a narrow pursuit of power for example because power is I mean power can be defined in many different ways um, in one sort of way it's a very natural thing for people to want to feel like they've got a sense of agency like they sense a sense that they can volitionally um, engage in the world 
and the world will not resist that engagement but rather will um, conform with it you know you want to conform manipulate adjust arrange your environments in such a way that it nourishes you that you feel safe in it and you know you can call that power you know you can call that agency and but I, I would say that all those sorts of things are you know that's just a basic fundamental way in which organisms exist that, that organisms sort of um, resist the general entropic pools of the universe to throw chaos and all sorts of random shit in your direction you know organisms are you know they're, they're anti-fragile they adjust they um, yeah, they adjust their behaviour to maintain their own survival, to to maintain their, you know, structural integrity against a often confusing and chaotic external world. So, I mean, I'm, I'm getting a bit too philosophical for... Well, I don't, yeah, I just... Sometimes it just... Shit just happens, you know. But, um... So that's... So I've just talked about power in terms of just being a... a positive but also a a just a basic component of being an organism an organism of being a life form but you know particularly in human beings there's also a kind of a negative aspect of power when it sort of consumes one's ego and consumes their entire value structure you know because um I go about this it's kind of just like it can you know like I've talked about um, addiction as being a kind of hedonic treadmill where you're just running and running for something without ever actually going anywhere you know um, power can be a bit like that where you're you constantly feel a sense of dissatisfaction a constant sense that you don't have enough power so you um so you endeavour to get more and more control, more and more agency over your environment. And then that can often, particularly in the case of humans, that can lead to you um, engaging in the world in such a way that you exert power and control over other people, where you want to manipulate other people to conform to your own personal desires and agendas. And, you know, independent of what they think, independent on what they care about and I think that's that's the uh, coming back to the, the original topic that I was talking about you know cultivating the capacity to care you know the, the capacity to exert power and control is the uh, often the, the negative of that is the the underbelly of caring you know because when you care about a person you are wanting to represent what they think, their wishes, their desires, um, their own needs. You're, you're representing that and you're caring about it and you're not ignoring it in favour for your own personal values and needs and stuff, you know. Because, you know, in social, in social situations there's always going to be a balance as though they're always going to be a mutual interplay and it's it's not necessarily obvious that people's needs will always conflict with one another you know very often they they converge and then you have relationship you know when different diverse needs can cooperate on a a convergent group kind of need you know but obviously you know when one is in the narrow pursuit of power, you know, people's, other people's needs, other people's thoughts and intentions, it, they only become relevant insofar as they relate to your own personal pursuit of your, your own needs, you know. They become superfluous or irrelevant when they are seen as coming into conflict with your own idea of your needs, or whatever. And um, and yeah, so yeah, how how human beings sort of play these sort of social games of power and manipulation, and uh, 
Machiavellian kind of tactics of feigning and performing. You know, it's, it's always it's always been a a strange, slightly threatening, but also peculiar thing for me to kind of understand and wrap my head around. Um, and I guess maybe this, you know, it's comes from my own sort of neuro neurodivergency of being, you know, slightly on the um, the autistic spectrum, which means that um, you know, for me, sort of truth is. Um, and authenticity is kind of, it's always been a, you know, an, an, an inherently kind of, um, it's always been my sort of orient, orienting space, you know, it doesn't say that I've never lied in my life or done any of that, but, um, you know, it's always come as a surprise to me, a kind of stupid, it's a surprise that makes me feel stupid in the moment when people do lie, you know, but, and people do sort of don't say the truth, but I don't know. I think it's just you know something that neurotypical people do tend to do. It's um you have the whole phenomenon of like white lies and stuff like that, and uh, people will just say stuff to each other just to appease them and stuff. And, um, and you know sometimes you know it's brutal honesty and total honesty can be too much. It can be excessive. So I can understand it. But then sometimes... Sometimes the most caring thing you can do for a person is to tell them the truth. But not... But it's... um. It's always a balancing act. You know, you've got to meet people where they are, where they want to be meted. You know, there's no use in just going around shouting, you know, hard truths at people, you know, just for your own kind of weird agenda, that like you want to be this sort of prophesizer or, you know, dispelling wisdom on people or whatever, you know, because then you can kind of get caught in sort of egocentric kind of um, modes of being, where your, your ego gets something from dispelling wisdom and shit, you know. Um, but yeah, so <sighs> yeah, I don't know what more to say. I mean, the the whole process, the project of cultivating your capacity to care, not just for yourself, but for things outside of yourself. It's it's a lifelong kind of project, and there's no easy way to do it, I think, it's, um, I think it's, you know, it's, um, first and foremost, you know, before one can care about other people, they must learn to care about themselves, and caring about yourself isn't a, um, a selfish thing, I think it's, um, it's a necessary thing, you know, you know, it's, um, it's an approach to your own organism, an approach of nurturing it and um, caring for it, you know? I mean, how, how are you going to be able to care for other people if you do not first care about yourself, you know? And when you are able to care about yourself and to nurture yourself, then from that excess energy that you produce from that, you can then dispel that outside of yourself, you know? When you're already tired and frustrated from your own lack of self-care, that that cluster of energy um, bleeds into the way you engage with the world. It bleeds into your interactions with other people, and I think it hinders your ability to appropriately care for them. You know. So yeah, I guess this sort of this ties into the sort of. Um, you know, the ending sentiment that I sort of derived from my recent podcast with Kendall, uh, which I'd, you know, I'd recommend people go to listen to, because I think it's, it was very interesting. I learned a lot from it. But I find uh, an ending sentiment that I got from that was, you know, we can only, was the idea that we can only hope to heal other people when we first are able to heal ourselves. 
and um and yeah I think I'll leave that at that um it's been interesting enjoy the rest of your day like and subscribe and check my links and shit whatever I've also got a second podcast or YouTube channel called the Money Mystic um podcast where I talk about different sort of topics to this, you know, more um, philosophical topics relating to money and uh, economics, but um, that's my own separate kind of hyperfixation. I wanted to sort of separate them out, keep more of my mindfulness, psychology, philosophy kind of content on this channel, and then diverse, diversify away into other sort of stuff, you know, whether, wherever curiosity leads me, I will go. Adiós.